superstar, war crime, sun sail, big time, blue whale, greatest love on TV, telecom reality, drag queen, millionaires, truth machine and teddy bears, Oopalula, genocides, coke and cola, northern lights, red bob, ocean liner, Big knob, sweet red china, black hole, serial killer, Nat King Cole and wishful filler. <laughs>
Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land. Every secret brotherhood, every secret society, every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. They do not believe in Lucifer. They do not believe in any entity called a devil, and they do not believe in God. It is a mistake for you to assume that they do. They are atheists in the strictest sense of the word. They are humanists. That's their religion. At the highest level, their goal is to create a world in which the adepts, the thousand points of light, working behind the veil to create the culmination of the great plan can realize the ultimate happiness for mankind. That's why they don't oppose pornography. That's why they don't oppose certain crimes. That's why they say you should not be put in jail for the rest of your life for murder or anything else. There should be no death penalty because it was a learning experience. <laughs> And having gone through that learning experience, you're a better person now. This is what they teach. They believe punishment for these crimes is nothing more than vengeful retribution, which is wrong in their eyes. So these are really the two philosophies that we have competing with each other in the world today. Who brought man the gift of fire? Prometheus. Who was Prometheus? Lucifer. What was the gift of fire? Knowledge, intellect. Has it man created industry, culture, society, science from the use of one solitary thing? Fire. Without fire, none of it would have occurred. None of it. Nothing. There would be no society without fire. That's how it's represented in the ancient myths and in the mysteries. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is it represented as? A bolt of lightning struck a tree. The tree burst into flames. Ancient man, if you watch the movie Quest for Fire, rushed up and grabbed one of the burning branches and it burned his hand and he let it go. He probably didn't go any farther than that the first time. The second time he may have found a deer that had been roasted by the heat of the fire in the forest. And being hungry, maybe he partook of some of that meat and found that it tasted pretty good. Also the fire was warm and didn't get cold at night. And this is where the whole battle between the forces of light and darkness comes from. A man sat up on a rock one night, watching the sunset, and said, Boy, I'm in deep trouble now. I can't see in the dark. There's wild beasts out there. There's tigers with teeth seven inches long that want me for dinner. What am I going to do? He didn't know what to do. Neither would many of us put in that situation. But we would know one thing. We're in deep trouble. And so for a good part of his history, man sat huddled in the darkness in some place that made him feel secure, waiting to be saved. Now remember, folks, 
I'm not telling you what I believe. I'm telling you what is taught in the mysteries. I'm telling you what our enemies believe. Make no mistake about it, they are our mortal enemies. They want to see us wiped off the face of the earth. A man huddled in this darkness, fearful, trembling, cold, hungry. And around about he could hear the beasts roaring. And sometimes they were roaring because they were after him. And sometimes he was eaten. A man eventually saw another tree struck by lightning and grabbed that branch with that flame on it. And by a little experimentation, he learned how to keep that fire going. And if he could keep the fire going, he knew something nobody else knew, and he became the first king, the first priest, the first scientist, all rolled into one. And he would burn this fire and keep it going. Another man in the cold of the night, wanting to escape from the terrors that were out there, would gravitate toward this glow. And they would see this man sitting there. And if he was kind, he would let them come to the fire. And they would be warm. And they would be protected. Because if the wild beast came, he'd pick up a branch and shove it in its face, and the beast would go away. And so the forces of light overcame the forces of darkness. And in the sunshine of the morning, the newly risen, resurrected child that had died the night before, their savior warmed them and saved them from the terrors of the prince of darkness. You have to study these things to understand your enemy. Any general who ventures upon a battlefield without understanding the enemy is doomed to defeat. What is the upshot of this? What am I getting at here? These people believe, and they have conducted themselves according to their belief and their philosophy since the very dawn of man. These people learned how to control others through the use of a hidden knowledge. This ability to keep that fire going was a technology that nobody else knew. By observing the fire, by keeping it going, by creating ceremonies around this fire, they became a mystery to the others. A mystery always holds sway over those who don't understand it. And the priesthood was born. No king ever existed without the permission of the priesthood. Now, I don't care what religion you're talking about or what period of history you're talking about, it is the truth. Kings never had the power, and don't to this day. Kings exist at the whim of the real power, which is the priesthood standing behind the throne. And when the kings ceased to be a benefit to the priesthood, they would simply poison him and get rid of him in some other way. The king is dead, long live the king, and there would be another king appointed. There was even a time in history when the king was a sacrificial king like John F. Kennedy was in the Temple of the Sun known as Dewey Plaza. They would pick a young man with the height of his virility, appoint him king for one year. During that time, he could do or say or command whatever he wanted. The priesthood was always there to make sure he commanded the right things, have any woman that he wanted. And at the end of the year, he was ceremoniously sacrificed upon a rock his heart ripped out, his body dismembered into 14 pieces and scattered over the land. And this is where the legend of the Osirian cycle began. It was to ensure the fertility of the crops of the next year. And young men would volunteer for this in their patriotic duty to their kingdom, to their family, so that they could have prosperous years. Much as our young men may volunteer to rush out over the water to a place called Kuwait or Iraq and die in the godforsaken sands of a place that nobody can even find on a map.
We need to do some serious evaluating, some very serious checking out of agendas. You know what's wonderful about America? You can have a press. You see, what happens when you broadcast the truth is you piss everybody off. I want you all to get interested in this. All of you should be publishing a newsletter or a newspaper. All of you should be documenting what you publish. All of you should have a satellite receiving station and be rebroadcasting programming to your neighborhood. All you got to do is make sure that you're broadcasting on a frequency that's not interfering with any other broadcast. people be free, even if they disagree with you. And I believe in freedom. You always know. We always know which is the right way and which is the bad way. The bad way sometimes feels better, so we may choose that way and justify it by rationalization in order to make ourselves feel better about the bad that we did. Isn't that the way we all do things? Even if we do something wrong and we know we're doing something wrong, don't we attempt to rationalize it in our own mind and to our friends to justify what we're doing? So I believe it's a great fallacy to set out to brand those whom we disagree with as being evil people. The result of their actions we may perceive to be evil. We may perceive it to be bad. But I guarantee you those people don't see it that way. You see, nobody gets up in the morning and sets out to do evil. Nobody consciously does that. I've never met any person in my entire life who said, I'm evil, I'm going to do evil things, I like to do evil things, I want to do evil things. They don't exist, in my knowledge. And when we present ourselves to them in that light, we're good and they're evil. Do you think we have a chance of getting them to listen to us? Not on your life. It's not going to happen. So I think we have to change the way we talk. We have to talk to them in a different manner. these things need to be passed on to you and I think you need to start examining yourself, your agenda, your mission. Who are you? What are you about? What do you believe about America? Is it true? Are you helping to divide us more? Or are you helping to bring us together? Do you really understand what this country is all about?